priests and seminarians and religious and lay alike. He lectures widely on the thoughts of our uh, last three popes, particularly uh, JP2 and the theology of the body. We are really, really honored to have him with us here at Chesterton. And uh, please give him your attention. Thanks so much, Father Landry. Thank you, Mr. Janeiro. Good morning still, everyone. A few, we've got a few minutes to go before noon. This is my first time doing a Zoom webinar, so we'll get through this together. Please say a prayer that we get no sort of interruptions or anything else like this uh, as, as we go through it. It's a, it's a joy for me to be able to meet your community and to be able to talk a little bit about the book I published last year, what its contents are and why it's important, especially for high schoolers as you begin to look more and more toward the future and what God's asking of you and how you want to respond to those deep questions. I am trying to push my screen. There we go. Okay. In almost every sphere of life, those who take anything seriously come up with a plan. I'm from New England, which is the region of sports championships. And, um, and if, if you want to create a winner, you've got to come up with a plan. Bill Belichick doesn't just say to the New England Patriots, let's wing it. Tom Brady didn't grow up eating Doritos in Twinkies uh, and blowing off his classes. I mean, there was so much contained in what eventually led to those championships. It's the same thing with flourishing businesses. You've got to have a really good plan and you've got to execute the plan. Triumphant political campaigns. Successful individuals in almost any sphere of life are those who have an idea of where they want to go and then start to choose adequate means to get there. Those who get results are those with better plans who implement them with perseverance. And if this is the situation in these areas that I've just described, it's also the area, it's, it's also important in the spiritual life, which is way too important for us to just wing and go as the quote spirit moves us because the spirit almost never moves us toward undisciplined. What's the importance of a spiritual plan? Jesus talked about it. He said, no disciple, disciple is the Greek word for student, is superior to the teacher. But when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Ultimately, the point of our life is to become more and more like God. We've been made in God's image and likeness. And Jesus wants to train us there. And a plan, plan of life helps provide that training. St. Paul, throughout his writings in the New Testament, showed us that training in the Christian life. He's sort of like an expert coach, a great musical teacher who not only allows us to learn something in our head, but helps it to go from the head to the heart, out to the hands, the knees, the feet, et cetera, so that it really becomes part of us. He urged St. Timothy, you can see in that middle quotation, to train yourself in godliness, for all physical training is of some value. Godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And St. Paul was one who lived by a plan of life, a routine. He followed the advice that he would give to St. Timothy and all the first Christians. He said, I don't run aimlessly as if there's no direction I'm heading in. I don't box as if I'm shadow boxing or just hitting the ear. I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. He knew he needed some personal discipline over his body if it was going to obey what Jesus was saying through his soul and his spirit. And we, like St. Paul, likewise need that training. What are the elements of a spiritual plan? There are basically two. It's pretty simple. The first is we got to have the right goal. And then second, we've got to have means adequate to reach that goal. If we have the wrong goal, we're just going to be lost. There's an old Chinese aphorism that if you don't know where you're going, any road will do. We have to know where we're going. Following in Jesus' footsteps all the way to the right side of Jesus in the Father's house, we pray. Likewise, we've got to have adequate means. You know, sometimes when we start at the beginning of Lent, 
there are a lot of people who have made Lenten promises that are like totally inadequate to the purpose of Lent. For example, giving up potato chips isn't going to make you a great saint. Uh, we've got to do more. We've got to look to see whether what we're doing is actually going to help us along that journey that we need to walk. And so what's the goal of the spiritual life? Sacred scripture tells us, the popes have told us throughout the centuries, that the whole purpose of human life is holiness, which is a life that glorifies God, not just by giving him praise, but kind of reflects God from within the choices that we make every day. Other ways to phrase it would be to become like God, growing in his image and likeness. And since God is love, St. John tells us, means to receive God's love and then to learn how to love God and love others as Jesus himself shows us. That's what holiness means. It's the perfection of this type of love. A spiritual plan without this goal of holiness is to embark on a journey to the wrong destination. And so when we look at the goal of holiness, I just want to share with you a few thoughts of St. John Paul II. I had the joy to know St. John Paul II. I lived in Rome from 1995 to 2001 because I was an identical twin and first met him with my identical twin, who was likewise a seminarian with me at the North American College. He was shocked at how identical we really were. We made him laugh that first time. And once you make John Paul II laugh, he remembers you. And he always called me from that point forward, Il Gemello Americano, the American twin. And, um, and so I met him 11 times. And he had a profound impact on me. I'll sh save you all the personal stories and conversations that we had. But in 2001, as he was getting close to the end, he gave a pastoral plan for the third Christian millennium. What the church is supposed to be doing for the next thousand years, into which we're now 20. And what did he say the church needs to do? He said, I have no hesitation in saying all pastoral initiative, because that means everything the church does, parishes, Catholic hospitals, Catholic food pantries, Catholic schools, etc., must be set in relation to holiness. That's the goal. Stressing holiness remains ever more urgent, he said, because a lot of people just think, I just got to be a good person. God calls us to be more than merely good. He calls us to be like him. It's necessary to rediscover, he says, the full practical significance of the universal call to holiness, that all the Christian faithful, not just popes, priests, and religious, all the Christian faithful, you and me, of whatever state or rank, passing grade, but to do as well as we can. For some of us, that'll be A's and A pluses. For some of those, for some of us, it might be solid C's. But as long as we're trying, we're growing. In the spiritual life, many people settle for mediocrity, just being a little bit better than their neighbors. God wants to give us so much more than that, but he requires our response. The time has come, John Paul II concluded, excuse me, to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. It's not some type of extraordinary existence. It's ordinary Christian living, but with high Christian standards, the standards Jesus himself shows us and wants to help us to live up to. What are the meaning, what are the means for the training in holiness? St. John Paul II said that they're a little different for every person because we're a little different and our circumstances of life vary. But he says every one of us needs a genuine training in holiness, just like a boxer's trained by a trainer in preparation for a big fight, just like a piano teacher has a teacher working on the scales and the arpeggios and everything else. So we need training in the spiritual life. And he underlined six main pillars of that training. None of these should surprise us all that much, but we just can't do them a little. We've got to really receive all that God wants to give us in these. First is prayer, he said, that the training in holiness calls for a Christian life distinguished above all by the art of prayer. Prayer is an art. It's not a technique. It's not engineering. It's not just where we sit or how we breathe or what we say. It involves inspiration. It involves God's inbreathing, literally. 
to which we respond. It's an art we have to learn. And we're constantly saying to Jesus, like the first disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus wants us to learn. And sometimes when we just go to him and say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. We're already praying pretty well because he will respond. Prayers first, that intimate conversation with God in which he comes to abide in us and we abide in him. Prayer is not just an exchange of words or thoughts. It's ultimately an exchange of persons, which God comes to dwell within us and we dwell within him. There's th nothing more awesome than that. Sometimes we can say prayer is boring, I don't know. The most important thing we need to learn how to do is to hear God and speak to God. The Christian life is distinguished above all by the art of prayer. Next is Sunday Mass, John Paul II says, the little Easter of every week. We've been missing it during these days because of the restrictions with COVID-19, but I hope our hunger is growing for the real need for us to be with God and to be with others. Receiving God within is the real secret to growth and holiness. He'll do so much work on the inside, but we need to show up with hunger. Third is the sacrament of confession. John Paul II said, especially for young people, that the real way we grow most quickly is through taking good use of the sacrament of confession. When we examine our conscience well, we see those areas in our life where we really need God. We get to know ourselves so much better. And then we go to God in the sacrament and we say, help. And when he forgives us, he also gives us his healing graces and his help from within really to grow. That's the third pillar. The fourth is grace. Grace basically means God's action. It always starts with God. The growth in holiness is not like a 10,000 step staircase in which we've got to lumber up one by one. It's really God coming down. St. Therese Lisieux said this at the beginning of the foundation of elevators in the late 1800s. It's like God coming down in an elevator with an elevator um, attendant saying, would you like a lift? And we get on in and he lifts us up. That's what grace does. Fifth is listening to God's holy word. A lot of the times we don't take sacred scripture all that seriously, unfortunately. We don't hunger for every word that comes from God's mouth. But sacred scripture is so essential if we're going to grow to become like God, because in sacred scripture, God has given us a mirror by which we can really see what holiness is and what the failure of holiness is. I remember once I was in the airport in Providence, Rhode Island, it was before TSA pre-check, and so everything took a lot of time to get through security. And I was putting my shoes back on and my belt back on and, you know, putting all the stuff back into my pocket. And I looked on up and I saw another priest there. He was dressed in blacks. And so I waited for him, introduced myself, asked him if he had time for lunch. And he said, yeah. So we went over to the locals barros there. And when we got to the cashier, she asked one bill or two because she saw us with the same uniform. And I said, one, at which this priest from Cleveland, his name was Father Bob, said, no, 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 two. I said, Bob, when I'm in Cleveland, you can pick up the tab, but you're closer to me, so please allow me to do it. And then he shocked me, and he said, Sirach says we should go Dutch, meaning split the bill. And I looked at him, and I said, well, Jesus told us to love one another as he has loved us, and the Last Supper wasn't Dutch. I'm paying. So I picked up the bill, but when we got to the seat, I said, did Sirach really say that? And he opened up his backpack, pulled out a very worn Bible, turned in his first turn to Sirach 43. In verse 2, it says, when you're on a journey, share the expenses. I said, Bob, that's pretty impressive that you know the Bible that well. How'd you get to know the Bible that well? And he said, he had made a promise before he was ordained a deacon, which is the last step before you're ordained a, a priest when you're on the road to the priesthood, that every year he would read the Bible once from cover to cover. And he started that, and he was now 26 years into his, um, to pass that diaconal ordination. And so he said, when you've gone through the Bible 26 times, you begin to know what Sirach says about sharing expenses on a journey. To read the Bible in an entire year, I wonder what you'd say it would take. Actually, it takes between 72 and 75 hours. That's it. 
if you were to spend 12 to 15 minutes a day, you'd read the entire Bible in a year. And think about what would happen to your life if you started to get to know the Word of God that way, so that from within, it could start to take on your flesh, and your words would start to sound more like God's words. It would be extraordinary. I'd really encourage you to take the Word of God very seriously. And the sixth pillar John Paul II talked about was sharing this gift of the Word of God not keeping it to ourselves, because as Pope Francis reminded us, when we've really met Jesus, when we've really come to know God's love for us, given to us through sacred scripture, how could we possibly keep that to ourselves? We become like St. Paul, someone who bursts wanting to share it, as he said, woe to me if I don't proclaim the gospel. So those are the six pillars, the six main activities that St. John Paul II describes in a training for holiness. And again, it's not just checking boxes here. It's really plumbing the depths of these six ways we really encounter God in our life. What is a plan of life? Plan of life integrates those pillars into our life, opening ourselves to the help that God wants to give us to live by those means. And that requires effort. Other ways of phrasing a plan of life is a unified series of commitments we make to respond to God's help to grow in holiness. It's a game plan for our spiritual life. It involves different spiritual exercises given to us by saints and spiritual directors to translate our desire to grow closer to God from vague wishes to realities. There have been a lot of people who have tried diets, ooh, I'd like to lose weight. But it's not just enough to want to lose weight. You've got to sort of give up sweets. You've got to exercise. You've got to drink a lot of water, these types of things. A plan of life helps us to make our desire for holiness concrete. It's geared to leading us toward a full-time awareness of God and how God's trying to help us at every moment of our life. It's a means by which we respond to God's call to live in his kingdom, to follow Jesus, to cooperate with what the Holy Spirit's trying to do within us to make us more and more like Jesus. This is what it means to have a plan of life, these series of unified spiritual practices that bring us more and more into God's life and bring his life into ours. In the book, Plan of Life, I describe and develop a series of different practices to help us to keep that holy awareness of God throughout the day so that we might remain in him and he remain in us. There, I distinguish between basics, which all of us should start out with, and then a section I call beyond the basics, that once we've gotten that good foundation, we can continue to grow in these ways. These are the basics that I list. The first is an openness to the Holy Spirit. Our Christian spiritual life is life according to the Holy Spirit. If our spirit's different than what the Holy Spirit is guiding us toward through the church, then it's not really coming from God and can actually not lead to holiness. But to just say, come Holy Spirit and let him lead us first step in any real growth in Christian spirituality. Heroic moment, that means we get out of bed when our alarm clock goes off or when we're called. If we snooze at the first moment of the day, often it leads to a type of spirituality in which we lose battles when we know we're supposed to get out of bed, but we just can't overcome the sort of bodily inertia. If we're able to win that battle, it's like 50% of the battle during the day. When I used to teach this in parishes where I was pastor in Massachusetts, parents used to always come and thank me because once their sons or daughters started to do this, so much of the rest came more easily at home. All the order in their studies, their order in balancing the various aspects of their life came from winning that first big battle. A morning offering, as soon as we get up, we give the day to God. We thank him for the gift of another day, and we ask his help to be able to live it in communion with him. At the very end of the day, we examine how we live that day, and that involves basically three things. Reviewing God's presence with us throughout the day, thanking him for always being there for us and helping us in the various ways that we could recall, and then at saying sorry for the times that we weren't aware of him or where we did opposite of what we know he would have been asking of us. We say sorry, and then we say, help me more tomorrow. Give me another shot. I want to do better tomorrow. That's the general exam. Regular prayer. 
I'd encourage you to try to spend at least 15 minutes a day opening yourself up to God. Sacred scripture we've already talked about. Keeping holy the Lord's day we've mentioned. Frequent confession. You know, Pope Francis goes every week. Are we bigger sinners than Pope Francis? <laughs> you know, St. John Paul II would go every week. I go every Tuesday. Um, because we really grow when we receive God's help. And in this Easter season, we remember what Jesus said in the parable of the prodigal son, that basically every reconciliation is a resurrection, that we're dead and we come to life again. That's why he founded the sacrament of confession on Easter Sunday night. Adoration, especially of the Eucharist, because we, when we spend time with Jesus there in the Holy Eucharist, our whole life begins to change. And the Eucharist becomes like a super magnet drawing us to him. I'd really urge you to do a charity. The fruit of the entire Christian life is how we love God and love others. Holy Week, which we've just gone through, is a way in which we enter far more deeply into the most important events that have ever happened. And then Marian devotion, particularly through the rosary, which the saints have called the summary of the gospel and an extraordinary means by which we're able, with Mary, to ponder the great mysteries in her son's life so that we may obtain the mysteries they contain. I've got beyond the basics, which I won't go through with you because we've got to lay those foundations first, but there are many other ways that we can continue to grow afterward. Just some final tips and thoughts before I get to the most important part of my presentation, which is your questions. What I've given is not an exhaustive list of helpful spiritual practices and exercises but they do cover the essential elements. Knowing and listing them is pretty easy. Putting them into practice is what's the challenge. St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans that the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I want to avoid, sometimes I don't avoid. Plato, the great Greek philosopher, used to think that as long as we knew something, we'd automatically do it. He was wrong. It requires a lot of effort to be able to do what we know we ought to do. But we're not alone in that effort, and that effort doesn't come principally from us. God's going to give his grace to help us. No one can do everything at once. What I'd encourage you, if some of these things that I've just talked about briefly are new to you, choose one or a few of these practices and begin to form new habits. Once those good habits become part of your second nature, as St. Thomas Aquinas used to call it, that our virtues, we can become our own parents essentially by the character we develop. Once these new habits become part of us, it's then easier for us to move on to others. Be patient with yourself as you're trying to grow, but also persevere. It's not going to be easy, but some of the times it's that good fight that really makes us win, not just the particular battle, but strengthens us for the war. Jesus said during the Last Supper, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And so he wants both knowledge as well as action to put his words into practice. And he sends the Holy Spirit to us precisely to make that possible. If you'd like to, if I've gone a little bit too fast with my quick New England cadence and you'd like to sort of find out more, you can download a copy of this presentation by going to the website, um, catholicpreaching.com, and just on the right column there, you'll see recent talks. and It'll be the second most recent talk because after we're done, I've got another one today for the UN community. But now I've got some time for your questions and comments. Thanks very much for your participation. Thank you, Father. That was very awesome. Um, okay, so I have, I'm gonna ask you two or three questions together. The first is, what are some concrete ways that we can better know the Bible? How can we open and know the Holy Spirit more? And do you know of a good scripture reading plan slash schedule? Okay, thanks for those questions. Concrete ways to know the Bible. I would encourage you first to start with the Gospels, which are much easier to understand, for example, than the book of Revelation or the book of Leviticus. There are so many incredible resources today, both on the internet as well as books. If I'm going to give you one site, I would say um, the St. Paul Center for Theological uh, Research, I think is the last word, but it's stpaulcenter.org. 
Scott Hahn, who's a great layman, he used to be a Presbyterian minister before he became a Catholic, founded it. And he's got some of the best young scripture scholars making the Bible way more accessible for the rest of us. And so I'd encourage you to go there as a concrete way. How do you get to know the Holy Spirit better? I would first just ask him to reveal himself to you. Come Holy Spirit is one of my favorite prayers. It's just three words long. Second, I'd encourage you to read a little bit about the Holy Spirit. In sacred scripture, like for example, John chapter 14, John chapter 16, Jesus says an awful lot about the Holy Spirit there. But if I'm going to recommend one book on the Holy Spirit, which would be excellent, there's a beautiful book by the preacher to the papal household for the last 40 years. His name is Father Raniero Cantala Mesa, and it's called Sober Intoxication in the Spirit. And it really walks you through all the steps and helps you to fall in love with the Holy Spirit and let him start to lead your life. And then in terms of a plan for sacred scripture, if you just type into Google, Catholic Bible plan 365 days, you'll get lots of reading plans there that you can then use throughout the entire year. You can do them on the apps on your phone. You can do it in a book if you wanted. If you're looking for a good Bible to get, I generally recommend the Ignatius Press Catholic Study Bible, which has a lot of good explanations as we go through. So I hope those are concrete enough for the first level of the questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Father. Um, here are another two. Um, should we focus first on forming new good habits or removing old habits? And then how do we establish a plan of life without turning it into simply boxes to check or just going through the motions? Okay. Forming new habits and eradicating bad, new good habits and eradicating bad habits do kind of happen at the same time. But in general, I encourage you to focus on forming the good habits. Because sometimes when we form that good habit, it can crowd out the bad habit. Let me just give you one example. Let's just say, for example, you struggle with using foul language. And the more you keep saying, I'm not going to say that phrase, or I'm not going to say those words, you're thinking about those words a lot. But if you start to say, why did God give me the capacity to speech? It's to praise him, for example. The more you start saying, like if you were to just use the word Jesus, his holy name as a throwaway word, as soon as you catch yourself doing it, if you say, Jesus, help me, you're turning something that could be a violation of the second commandment into an act of praise. So you crowd out the bad habit by a good habit. If you're really struggling with disobeying your parents at home, try to obey even your brothers and sisters because the growth in that virtue of obedience will make it easier for you to obey promptly your parents. So focus on the good habit because that can have really powerful expulsatory powers versus the bad ones. With regard to the plan of life, I think the most important thing is not to look at them as a list of things you have to do, but as various encounters with Jesus over the course of the day with God. Once you start to see that they all are meant to come from the Lord and bring us to the Lord in the sacred encounter, then all of them begin to get connected. And then as you go from one to the next, they become organically a part of us rather than just a whole bunch of isolated new practices. Because ultimately the plan of life is to help us to live with God. Each of them can and does when we live them the right way help us to do that. But we can't just see them as isolated. Likewise, for example, with the commandments, we have to see how they help us to love God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor, because we couldn't be loving our neighbor if we were disrespecting them, or hating them, or killing them, or taking advantage of them, or ripping them off, or lying to them, or getting upset and jealous for what they have. So all of it's integrated, and I think the best way to do it is to make sure you focus on that wholeness. Awesome. Thank you, Father. We have three minutes left. Um, so I'll give you one question and then um, uh, if you have any final thoughts, that'd be awesome. Um, the question is, do you have any tips slash advice to our, for people who are easily stressed out 
or anxious that are trying to grow in their faith. Um, so essentially how to be less anxious about facing these challenges um, that the plan of life presents us. I think the greatest um, antidote to anxiety is to recognize just how loved you are. Jesus said in the Last Supper, and it's pretty amazing words, just as the Father loves me, I love you. Think about that for a second. Could the Father love the Son any more? No. And Jesus loves us just as much as the Father loves him. And if we know that we're loved that much, we don't stress out the same way because we can't lose that love. And so who cares, honestly, if we flunk that test? If we've worked hard and we've done the best job that we can, we're not going to lose God's love if we happen to fail at something. We don't have to be afraid. We don't even have to be afraid of the like anxieties of someone in our family, for example, dying of COVID-19, etc. Because when we really recognize that God loves us that much, we have great hope that even should they pass from this world, God will still love them. And as long as they're open to that love and allow the transforming power of that love to happen, we have incredible hope for them. And so that for, for me and, and the help that I give to lots of people who come to see me, I think the great antidote to anxiety is to really dwell, remain in that love of the Lord. And we do dwell in it by thinking about it a lot, thanking God for it a lot, and then trying to pay it forward. Because when we begin to love others with the love with which we have first been loved, our capacity to receive that love grows. And the more we're filled with love, the more fear and anxiety is banned. Awesome. Thank you so much, Father. It's 1129. So we are just ending now. Um, yeah, good luck to everyone with their plans of life. Um, keep in mind everything Father said. And yeah, thank you so much, Father. It's an honor to have been with you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Also, one final closing note, guys, your house lunch links are posted right under the student life planner. Um, so go there for your house lunches. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Father.